the African nations are not really trading with each other to any great extent at this point. We as African people in America are not trading with each other at any point to any significant extent. If we were a major portion of the creation of our own wealth, we could then begin to demand the kind of prices we need in terms of trading with other people. But if we are not trading and enriching ourselves through cross trade, through internal trade, we have control of our internal markets, then we are at the mercy of whatever other people choose to pay for our goods and our services. If we do not control something of value, then we cannot punish or reward other people. Because you can only have power when you have something other people want and something other people need, and you can control it and give or withdraw it based on your own needs and so forth. But if you control no wealth, if you control nothing of value, if you own nothing of value, you make your market valuable by not making it openly accessible to everybody. So to enter it, they have to pay a price. And to get out of it, they have to leave something, you see. But it, and so no nation stands up and just let its borders remain open to be taken by every other nation. And ultimately, one nation or other tries to capture some vital resource, some vital human resource, a mineral resource, or some other kind of resource that it can use as leverage against other people. But if you don't own some vital human capital, some vital material capital, if you're not even controlled of access to your own market, you have nothing with which to balance the power of other people. And they therefore will use you up and eat you up and eat your life. When you study then the success and the achievement of other ethnic groups in this country, you will see that they achieved it not by loving everybody, not even by pursuing integration as their ultimate goal, but by identifying with themselves. I'm going to invite you to read Thomas Sowell's Ethnic America. I don't recommend hardly anything else he writes. It was amazing. He wrote such a book and came out the way he did. But particularly, read the story of the Irish. Read that. Read this situation. It's, it's of such, I think it's so valuable. Because sometimes you see, we are so close to our own problems as black people. It's difficult for us to separate our emotions from, you know, objectivity and objective knowledge. And sometimes if you want to come to understand why there's certain criminality and violence and why it's such a social disorganization and so forth in the black community. It pays you not to study black people first. Because mm -hmm. see, black people are not the only people who are violent. Black people are not the only people who are, were the majority of prison. Black people are not the only people who came from a peasant background and were taken into the urban centers of the world. Not by a long shot, okay? Prisons were invented before we were even out of, out of, out of slavery. Yeah. The first prisons in the world and in America were built right here before 45, 50 years before black people were even out of slavery. They were building prisons. And then it's interesting that when the whites were building prisons for themselves, they saw prisons as reformatories. And they carefully designed the prisons. You should get into the old prison literature and see how they, they tried to design the walls, the architecture, and everything it was perfectly designed to try to rehabilitate these people and bring about their rehabilitation. You should go back and, and uh, look at all of these parks. You look at Central Park. You read the history of Central Park. Central Park was a was a was a social rehabilitation project. They determined what trees they would plant in terms of what effect they would have on people's minds. How they would plant them and how they would place them. And I'm talking about white folk, because white folk were where today is. You, you can't imagine the kind of planning. They tried to plan the cities and lay out the streets and build the whole thing in a way to shape the consciousness of people. You see, because America was being inundated by immigrants and foreigners around the 1830s. And at this point, the, the urban areas were uh, uh, growing at 
<laughs> Why were these people overrun as they were brought into this country with disease, with tuberculosis, cholera, and all other kind of diseases that had disappeared from America? And therefore, people knew that when they would come into the neighborhood, you had to get out, or else the whole neighborhood would be plagued. Why were these people living in apartments that were built for one family, and they cut the apartments up into smaller size and put several families in it? Why were mothers and fathers, I'm talking about white folk here, why were mothers and fathers and children all laying up in one bed, yeah. in one room? Why did they have little boys' hotels where they paid for the pork and beef and let them sleep standing up in a halter for 12 cents a night? Yeah. Huh? Why were there thousands and ten thousand of, of white women on the streets of New York prostitutes and begging? Why were these girls out there attacking and doing it and cursing and doing all the other things that they were doing. You haven't heard about that? Why do you see these old buildings with iron bars over the windows and so forth? Who were they protecting their content from when black people weren't even in the city? Huh? Look and come alive and see what was going on, ladies and gentlemen. This was what was going on in America. Why is it now today then, in an effort to save their youth, the the whites then define adolescence as a separate category from adulthood and gave it special characteristics and created a special court for these children. And nowadays, now that the black children are the ones that are the center and focus of criminality, they are redefining adolescence out of existence and saying now that they're going to treat 12 and 13 year olds as adults. You must understand the politics of crime and understand the game that is being played here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Amos Wilson. He is the inspiration um, behind the Black on Black Crime Solutions panel that we have every year. This is our third year anniversary, and I am asking you to definitely spread the word and support our panel. Now, this is my Twitter, at Curse to Believe, and Instagram. And this is our GoFundMe account that I'd love for you to go ahead and support. Tell your friends, family, um, everybody. The event is July 16th, and we've raised $335 so far out of 5000 Now, the theme of this year is the power of the vote. And I have to change this from the website. Uh, we have updated flyer. Um, there's definitely a lot more panelists <laughs> than this. So, um, we have two judges, uh, we have, um, attorneys, the st uh, state attorney's office, the uh, office of the supervisor of elections, um, community activists, 
uh, Dr. AK, a uh, good brother. This is updated fly here, um, hosted by Suzette Speaks. Uh, it'll be great working with her. And I, I am so thankful for everyone who has supported us uh, thus far. Uh, it's a blessing. Um, thank you. And let's not forget, as Dr. Amos Wilson was saying, there's a game being played on us. I mean, why else, how could it be that we are killing each other the way we are? You know, think about it. What is the, uh, what are the contributing factors that is causing this hatred? You know, um, the broken homes, the lack of resources or the lack of the knowledge of the resources. There's money out there. Well, black folks are... Um, are not on the winning end of the stick most of the time. And I remember being in my own situation, being that I just got my voting rights back. My name is King Kevin Dorval, and, you know, I am the host of the Black on Black Crime Solutions panel, our nonprofit organization, Courage to Believe International. Uh, we are the ones that uh, have it every year, uh, being our third year, it is a blessing. Um, it's definitely a challenge uh, uh, fundraising. But I've always stood up for the community. And being that <laughs> I've been in the wars for years. I've been in the war for years. I finally got my, my voting rights back. This year's theme is the power of the vote. And we want to not focus solely on voting, um, per se, but the lack of voting or the lack of power within the black community. Notice I use the word power of the vote, thank God. Power or the lack thereof. So we hope to give a positive message, great panel, um, you know, support, spread, if, if, if anything else, you know, not any money, share, you know, uh, go on Facebook or this, go to GoFundMe, share the, click on the share, or tweet, or, you know, simply donate, you know, it's all a blessing. And um, we did receive a couple of checks. It's not updated on here. You know, the, the GoFundMe doesn't let me donate to myself. But uh, all is well. We're going to have a great event and uh, bring out, you know, the families free um, at the Worldwide Christian Center Church um, here in South Florida, uh, 450 North Pylone Road, Popular Beach. Florida 33069. Go to my website, thecursebelieve.com. And uh, thank you.